So first, I want to especially welcome all the trustees in the audience tonight. We do plan this evening session, particularly for library boards, and I hope a lot of you are watching at the library. With that, I want to say good evening from Chile Dubuque. I am Becky Heil, and it is my pleasure to introduce you tonight to our evening keynote speaker, Cindy Fessmeyer. She was also our opening kickoff presenter this morning and gave us lots to think about as we position our libraries to be the center of the community. Cindy's background includes working in the nonprofit world. She was director of a nationally recognized small library, consultant at the State Library of Wisconsin, and now an independent library consultant. She is going to be joined tonight by a panel to talk about the American Library Association's grant program, Libraries Transform Communities. So let's give a warm welcome to Cindy and the LTC team. Thanks, Becky, and thanks, Sam, so much for having us this evening. As we get started, I also want to thank Carrie, Kristen, and Zach for being here with us today at, you know, dinner time. So thank you for um, fitting it in and sharing your stories. Um, what I want to do is have us start with some introductions of ourselves. We'll introduce ourselves and then we'll give you a little bit of background on the ALA Libraries Transforming Communities program. And you'll hear about that program, the current one, um, grants to small and rural libraries from a number of different angles. And that's why Carrie and Zach and Kristen are here to share their experience with it. So let's get started with introductions. I'll start with myself. Well, though Becky said an awful lot, so I'll keep mine short, but what I do want to do and what each of us will do is share the reason why we got into librarianship. So I want to let you know that, like Becky just said, uh, my first professional career was in nonprofit administration, basically, and it's a high burnout industry. Not that libraries aren't, but it really is in nonprofits. I was a fundraiser and I was at the end of my rope and it was time to do something different. And I must have been a librarian in training because I did what I learned later were like informational inf interviews with people who work in different aspects of librarianship to determine whether I wanted to go into public or school libraries, but I was pretty sure that libraries were where I was go libraries were where I was going because every time I talked to somebody who was a librarian and did the like well, that's cool. How do you like the, your job? Their demeanor just changed. And they were like, I love my job. And that was so heartwarming to see that two to the one, people adored the work that they did. And I'm so pleased that I did that. I don't know, maybe that was my midlife crisis to switch from nonprofits to go into libraries. I'm so happy that I did. And I'm so happy to be here with you all today. And um, I'll just call on folks and have you introduce yourselves. So Carrie, would you tell us a little bit about you, please? Well, sure. I am Carrie Falk. I'm the director at the Shenandoah Public Library. I have been there for way longer than I'm going to tell any of you. And I've it has been a fantastic job. I'm really excited to be in the southwest corner of Iowa. I am a third generation librarian. My grandma and my mom were both librarians. So it kind of is in the blood. And probably my best library experience was I started as a high school page at the Lawrence Public Library in Lawrence, Kansas. And when I went to library school, and I had the opportunity to start and run their bookmobile program from scratch. It was the first year round bookmobile program that they had ever offered. They'd done summer bookmobile to the parks and the kids for parks and rec and summer reading program, but they'd never done a year round bookmobile. And it was very, very cool to actually get to create a small library in a big city. And that was where I realized that I really do like small library work. I like getting to know everybody and the collection. And you know that face-to-face that -face interaction was just so much fun. Thanks, Carrie. Um, next, let's hear from Dr. Zachary Steer. Hi, everyone. This is Zach Steer. I'm uh, head of children's services at Erickson Public Library in Boone. I'm very excited to be here this evening to uh, discuss this project. Um, but as far as librarianship goes, um, all I can remember is going to the, the library when I was a kiddo with a red wagon and my dad saying, fill it up. <laughs> So when I was 15, I became a library page in Ankeny, and then I uh, moved to neurological therapy for uh, just about a year or two, where I kind of gained some insight on program development, and then I went back to library, library land. I uh, was a library assistant and youth services librarian in Bondurant. I worked a little bit in the Library of Congress for a while, and then moved back to Iowa, where now I've been working in Boone for 10 years, and it's 
awesome. I love being a children's librarian. I've been able to work with NASA and connect with people like George Lucas and just, just, it's, it's such, it's a profession that just offers so many opportunities and I get to connect with people just like all of you. So thank you. That's awesome. Thank you, Zach. And Kristen Whitson from Wills, please. Hi, everybody. Thanks for sticking around or coming back for a late Thursday evening panel. Really appreciate it. Um, so I am not Laura Damon Moore, who is listed in the synopsis for this session. She's uh, a co-worker of mine at Wills, which is Wisconsin Library Services. Um, so we're up here in Wisconsin, and Laura and I are co-convening a hub of the Libraries Transforming Communities program, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, for me, my professional background is that I started out in human resources. I had a whole career in HR before I switch. My, my midlife crisis was also to switch into libraries. Um, and I had originally gotten into HR because I really loved um, sharing resources and being available for employees. Um, as many people probably know, that's not all HR does. And so all of that other stuff sort of after a while, I just thought, well, I don't wanna do any of that other stuff anymore. Um, but I decided to go to library school because librarians get to say yes to people and give them what they need all the time. It's, a, it's our whole job is to get people what they need. So, um, I went to library school up here in Wisconsin. After school, I was uh, hired by Wills, Wisconsin Library Services, um, originally to work on um, connecting local historical societies to each other in a community of practice. And now I just continue to convene groups of uh, librarians, archivists, local history folks, um, digital projects people all together uh, in communities of practice. So that's part of what I'm doing. And Cindy had asked us to share a fun thing about ourselves. And so I'll just share a fun thing, which is that um, last year I co-wrote a book on Wisconsin's LGBTQ plus history, and it was published by the Wisconsin Historical Society Press. So I'm coming off of a year of really exciting like book talks and stuff. So that's a fun thing about me. I know. Awesome, Kristen. Thanks. I'm glad you ended that because, I mean, we'll just go out on that high note of cool fun things. That's <laughs> awesome. Thing. <laughs> Um, so we're gonna we're gonna sort of jump in and and I'll start with some background um, for you all to give you an idea like why we're in this Zoom call together. Um, but I just want to mention that this is very conversational and we invite you to to treat it that way. Um, please along the way, if you have questions or thoughts that you want to share with us or with other people in in this session, just go ahead and put them into chat and I'll invite all of us to just sort of co-monitor the chat and between Carrie, Kristen, Zach, Becky, Sam and I, um, we'll be sure to call those things up and feel free to um, any any of you who can do that to just unmute and, and let us know what's going on in the chat if something timely comes up. So I want to start with um, the overview of the American Library Association's Libraries Transforming Communities effort. And it's been going on for Oh gosh, such a long time now. I think it began back in 2013. So it's sort of going on, on 10 years, which blows my mind. But um, the first iteration of Libraries Transforming Communities was uh, a partnership uh, financed by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, ALA in partnership with the Harwood Institute. So maybe you've heard about the Harwood Institute before. They're the turning outward people and, um, you know, libraries reflecting community needs in the programs and services that they offer. And then Harwood has a, a toolkit of ways that you can do that engagement. It's sort of a a recipe book, if you will. And when we go on to hear from um, Kristen, Carrie, and Zach, I'll put some links into the chat for you so that you can just take a look at those on, in, on your own time. Um, there are so many resources available there, but that is how I got my start with LTC, Libraries Transforming Communities. I was one of those uh, grantee organizations for their first round of grants in 
um, that went to 10 libraries around the country uh, who each built a team of five people. So 50 people in this cohort were trained over the course of a year by the Harwood Institute with support from ALA. And we learned how to engage with our communities. And we did a project, not at all unlike what you all did uh, if you were involved in the small and rural grant program with the current iteration of LTC. Now, LTC has changed over the years. They did an effort specifically for small and rural libraries, not this current one. Then they did something specifically for larger, more urban libraries and the engagement toolboxes that would go al along and make sense with those kinds of libraries. And then this current iteration was a, it still remains anonymous donation from somebody in this country who gave money to uh, ALA to help small libraries really connect with the, the people in the community. And this is how ALA chose to spend that money was by giving $3,000 grants straight to the libraries that are serving those communities. And, and along with that $3,000, they gave them uh, access to something that's available to you as well, a free facilitation kind of mini course that's available through uh, the ALA website, and then some support too. Uh, the, the, we just finished the third round of making grants to those libraries that are involved and um, represented with us here today, Carrie and Zach will talk about their experience as grantees from the state of Iowa. Now, along with that grant, there was a little bit of money left over and we sort of came up with the idea of doing support hubs for for some of the libraries. And what it is, is just sort of a casual invitation to any libraries that have gotten LTC grants to join in a monthly conversation about this work of doing community engagement. And that's why Kristen is with us today, because she is a co-convener of one of those hubs for the upper Midwest that includes the, the Wisconsin, where she and I are from, and the Iowa libraries and some other states as well. And um, so, so I, I start with kind of the big picture there, and I think what I'd like to do is hand it off to Kristen and ask her to talk about her experience as uh, one of those hub conveners. But I'll, I'll just let you know as she's getting ready to unmute and, and join us that my role with that is simply to coordinate the different hub leaders like Kristen is and ALA and to make sure that we're offering a sort of similar offering of conversations on a monthly basis across the country. Every state is represented one way or another. So um, with that said, are you ready to go, Kristen, and tell us a little bit about being a hubby? Yes, I'm ready to go. Um, so uh, thanks, Cindy. And as Cindy said, uh, Laura and I are co-conveners for the Upper Midwest Hub. So um, the Upper Midwest Hub includes Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois, and Indiana. Um, and so what that hub really means is that once a month, we provide this virtual space and some resources for grantees from those states um, to get together and share what they're working on for their grant projects. Um, we began our hub meetings in September of last year, and we pretty quickly heard from our hub members that most of all, they really needed this not to be another commitment on the list of things to do or another piece of like homework or another reading to pile up on their to be read lists, which all librarians have, as we know. Um, so in that first meeting in September, we had this, Laura and I had this idea that we would like demonstrate facilitation practices and provide these facilitation tools so that, you know, grantees could feel confident in their skills going into their community conversations. Um, and that was a really great idea, but that is not really what small and rural library folks needed from this particular experience. Um, you know, Laura and I are pretty experienced conveners, like virtually too. We're pretty good at like keeping people moving and connecting and accomplishing something by the end. Um, but I just have to tell you, this group of small and rural library folks just do not need that. They know how to facilitate, and if they don't, they have the ability to find those tools. What they really need is to be together with other small and rural library folks to talk through challenges that they're facing, um, get and give each other you know, inspiration, and not have a bunch of homework to go along with it. 
this actually happened just today. Laura and I had a upper Midwest hub meeting with this activity called the five H's and it's this way to map out your gifts. We'd sent out a worksheet ahead of time. But what we got was several very busy library directors who like came skating in between story time and something else that they had to do. Um, and they really, again, today just needed to be able to talk to each other. So I tell you all that to say that this actually seems really fitting on the ALA and hub side. This is exactly what this grant program about, is about, is libraries transforming communities by being the place where people gather. And in the hubs, especially here at the Upper Midwest Hub, it feels like we're the place that um, folks can gather, but we're not the experts in what they're gathering about, or that's not what they need our expertise for. And that seems to be exactly the role that we're playing in their work day. Um, our expertise in communities of practice is being used to form and hold that space for the people who really need it. So on our end, in that vein, um, we try to keep the scheduling and content of these meetings pretty loose and inclusive. Uh, we let grantees like Carrie and Zach and anybody who has received an LTC grant um, that they can join us, whether it's their first time or their last time, whether they're still working on their grant projects or not, whatever they need. Um, today, we talked about the wisdom of including brochures in mailings with your community surveys and what colors were best. But the last time we got together, we talked about the challenges of engaging with local government leaders. So it's all about whatever the grantees need for their work in that moment. And we're glad to be able to provide it. Um, honestly, sometimes what grantees need is just to not have one more thing on their calendars. So we have plenty of room for those folks too, whenever they can make it. So I would be glad to answer more questions about the hub a little bit later, but for right now, let's get to hearing from the grantees themselves, which is really the high points of this particular session. Terrific. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I think we're really lucky to have you as partners. You heard, if you were in the keynote this morning, you heard me talk about the work of being a change agent, doing community engagement. It's hard work, and um, you don't always get the most positive response that you might hope for. And so I truly think that the best way to get through it is to have each other's backs with other practitioners. And um, these hubs are meant to be sort of regional, um, you know, areas of, of practice to connect with other practitioners and share your trials and your triumphs together. So that was the intention of the hubs. Thanks for talking about the Upper Midwest Hub, Kristen. Zach, you want to tell us what your project was about? Yes, I am happy to do so. Um, at the end, I will share a link to my to the report that I had sent to you. Um, but yeah, so um, I got involved with this project, I would say sometime or later, let's see, spring of last year. Um, but, but prior to that, our library had uh, facilitated two community uh, stakeholders groups, community dialogue. And um, one of the reasons why is we were a NASA at my library site where we facilitated one about STEM education and learning. And then um, prior to this project, we then hosted and facilitated a community dialogue on equity and COVID-19. Um, just be, it was at the beginning of COVID and figuring out how equitable um, what, what were the equitable, equitable concerns in our community? And then this project, I um, became familiar with it from another uh, library individual. Um, so we were part of round two. And so I approached my director, uh, Jamie Williams in, uh, at, in, at my library, and I had explained this grant and how, as we have just heard, how libraries are change agents and how our library was already doing that and how this could elevate that even further. And so my director is really good about autonomy and said, okay, let's, let's do it. Let's go ahead and apply for this. And so we strategized on what we wanted to focus on. And again, the word equity came into our conversation. However, I wanted to be sure that equity was covered as much as possible. And so we started using the word dimensions, right? So our project, Activating Community Voices, focuses on um, the, uh, the dimensions of equity. 
So that could be race, transportation, food sustainability, poverty, um, education, early childhood, medical, LGBTQIA. Um, so what we then decided to do is how were we going to apply for this and ensure that we could accomplish what we were applying for? Because the time frame was a little short. And as a children's librarian, it came at the same time as summer reading start was starting. So we strategized and um, we had then decided that we wanted to um, obviously invite our, our community to an event. And we also wanted to invite professionals as well. You see part of our uh, stakeholders group, we still have, and these individuals are coming from all sorts of sectors and professions from medicine to higher education to early childhood and the like. So we already had our core group and we wanted to expand on that. And so we had, um, toyed with the idea of like a conference. And then we really landed on that word symposium because it narrows the focus a little bit more on a, one specific topic and that is equity. And to expand on that, we wanted to have a slate of speakers um, that covered the dimensions of equity. So our structure for this project, we had three keynote speakers and then we had nine breakout sessions. Our symposium went from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And um, the uh, initial speaker, the first keynote, I should say, I am a huge Mr. Rogers fan. I mean, he has impacted my life in so many ways. And I was at a bookstore and I saw this book that just came out called When You Wonder You're Learning by Greg Bear and Ryan Wazeski. And it was just like instantaneous. I felt like Fred was saying, this is the book that will that needs to be part of your symposium. So I have a mantra, go big or go home. The best, the best thing you can do is reach out and they can say no, or you get a bill or an honorarium price that's too high. Um, and the cool thing is they were so quick to respond and accepted the offer of being our first keynote. And so we had those, that, that auth, those two authors as our first keynote and everybody who participated and attended, I should say, they received a free copy and free because part of our grant money went to uh, purchasing those books as well. And so it was really great to get an author and authors, I should say, outside of Iowa. But we also wanted to ensure our keynotes, the next two were, were from Iowa. And so our second keynote, she's from Iowa State University's Extension and Outreach and really focusing on youth. And she had three youth uh, teens from Ames High School present on their topic. And then our third keynote was from Des Moines and uh, from the Oak Ridge neighborhood, focusing on urban. And you're like, well, Boone is not really urban, but there is a connection between urban and rural and how we can work together as well. So those were our three keynotes. And then we have a very strong partnership with Iowa State. And so I've been working with the Iowa State's College of Design, uh, Dr. Jan Ronjerud. And um, what we had decided was to um, have uh, professionals, like I said, from all sorts of uh, areas that covered topics of food sustainability, early childhood, transportation, housing, elderly services, arts and creativity. And so attendees would go to keynote, choose a three sessions, keynote, three sessions, keynote, three sessions. What became important for us prior to the symposium was to ensure that there was active interaction and conversation and dialogue. We were not wanting to just invite them to just listen, we wanted them to be involved. And so we had Padlet exercises, some of them brought, we had sticky note exercises, um, there are scenarios that went along, there was arts and creativity to really expand on the conversation. The other uh, element to this is the venue. So Des Moines Area Community College, DMAC, uh, we have a campus and we also have a great partnership. They offered the, this is the power of conversation and partnership. Um, they are a strong focus for them as DEI. 
And so they thought it was a natural fit to not only obviously have this symposium, but to host it on their site because uh, we just knew we wouldn't have the capacity to do that uh, at the library. Um, and so they offered to host it at the venue. They offered all technology support and there was no cost to the library at all. They paid for all of the speakers and the, um, yeah, all the speakers in the breakout sessions. Um, and then the only thing that our attendees had to pay for was their lunch, which was a very minimal cost. Um, the other element to this too, is we also wanted to ensure that the youth were involved because right, youth are you know the next generation. So I'd contacted um, the high school. They have a program called the EDGE program, which is more of an apprenticeship program to get uh, young adults involved in careers in the world and focus on global consciousness. And remind you, this was in May that I contacted her. She said, let's see. I had to wait until August to get back because summer vacation and all break, I should say, was happening. We started with 10 and I thought that was successful. And we ended up having 40 uh, different youth participate and we had a variety of topics. And so they did uh, breakout set or excuse me, poster sessions. So um, they came up with their poster and, and they put displays out and they were able to have conversations uh, with the attendees as well. So that was such a strong thing for our uh, symposium. And what really came out of it is our understanding that there is strong collaboration and partnership, and it's incredibly important to make that visible, especially in the library world. And I always, when I always talk about libraries to those who think we're archaic, I say that we are strong evolvers. That's what we do is we evolve. And more so than ever with COVID, what we have understood is we have to reach out and work collectively together to really tell the story of our community. And that in itself is investment, right? Sometimes it's like, how much money are you bringing into the community? And they like to talk to economics. What we recognize with this project is those investments are the stories of our citizens and our patrons and our community where then they want to probably hopefully invest in the community and help it grow in itself. So where do we go from here? We are continuing to uh, work with that stakeholders group. So we met once prior to the symposium, and this was another layer of this project for us. So we met to discuss those equitable dimensions and areas of concern. We then held another stakeholders, you know, or dialogue to discuss the symposium. And then we just put out a community survey. We will analyze the survey to get citizen data of equity in, in Boone. And once we analyze that, we will meet again with the stakeholders group. And our goal is not just to meet and discuss, but to discuss, uh, but to figure out programmatic opportunities on how we move forward. And we hope to have another symposium or something like that in the near future. So I hope that covers everything, Cindy. Oh, that's great. That's great. I just want to point out um, about halfway through, you said that you took it on yourself to invite people to be involved was the phrase that you used. And I, I just wanted to call that out. I think that that's... Um, whenever any library sort of has conversations or, or gets involved with their community, I feel like it's very common to hear over and over, oh, I would love to get involved. I just don't know how to. So sure. I just want to commend you on taking the initiative to extend that invitation. And that in and of itself is really quite a power move. So, um, <laughs> you yeah, know, you're no. taking your seat at the table. Exactly. And, and that's what I will say. And I'll end there is, um, is like you said, taking the seat at the table. Um, some of us are in communities that um, the library is seen very positively. And sometimes we have to remind uh, others that uh, we do have a can sit at the table and have um, can provide opportunities um, as well. So we're more than just the books and, and all of that, too. So thank you so, so much. Thanks for sharing your story. And we'll hear from Carrie too, how, what got you into it and what did, what did you do with your experience? Well, mine was a little bit different than Zach's, more on the traditional route, but 
I too had seen um, emails come across from Becky about the um, LTC grant and had thought about applying for it, but I am not always the most organized of individuals, and it's not always easy to talk myself into things. And so round one went through before I actually got it together. And the reason I had thought about having or applying for this grant was I had been approached by a group that started up in our community of Shenandoah called the Forum for Revitalization. And um, of course, with the 2020 census coming up, Shenandoah was pretty sure, and they were right, that they draw below 5,000 people in this past census. And so that is a concern to the community that, you know, there have been some major employers that have left. Um, obviously, we're losing some people with those employers. And so there are other things where they're concerned that if we don't do something about this now, our community is going to continue to decline in population, and we really don't want to see that. And so they were, the forum group was so kind as to approach the library and it was really nice to have somebody who was a former library trustee as part of that group and a librarian who knows it's important for libraries to be at the table to approach me. And so we decided to work together with the forum to apply for one of these grants. And so it, it gave me an opportunity to stretch myself because I don't know about the rest of you, but I don't feel that comfortable as a facilitator. And so I thought, you know, this would be a chance to make myself do it. And I had heard really good things about the facilitation e-course that is offered through this. And I know that Becky and Cindy have put up links to that. I would highly recommend that you go through that e-course yourself sometime when you get a chance. There's just a lot of good information that is useful for anything that you're facilitating. It isn't just specifically for this grant, but if you're, you know, if you're doing a book discussion group, if you're leading some programming, that stuff is very, very helpful. And so when we applied for our grant, we had thought maybe we would, well, we knew we were wanting to do a book discussion with um, Doug Griffith's book, 13 Ways to Kill Your Community. And I don't know if a lot of you were at the ILA conference in the fall, but he was the Thursday keynote speaker. And it was really amazing to finally get to hear him speak because we looked at having him come in. And even with the ALA grant, there is no way we could have afforded to have him comes to Shenandoah. So it worked out fine to see him through ILA. So I appreciate them paying for it instead of me. <laughs> but um, we had, I think, two discussions over the book. So we had 10 copies of the book. We passed them out around the community. We had people read the book and then come in and talk about, you know, where they saw Shenandoah in those 13 ways. What, you know, what were the things that resonated with you? What were the, the things that you saw that were good in our community? What are the things that you think need to change? And one of the things that I saw that was most incredible before we even started having the community conversations, I had people coming in the door to the library to talk to me and others about change in the community, about revitalization, about where we're at and where we're going. And it was just so cool to see that conversation start within the community and just to keep it rolling. And that was one of the, you know, one of my desires was to make revitalization important in the community, you know, have people talking about it and also get that forum to um, be in the forefront of people's minds. I think a lot of people in the community hadn't heard about them because they started about the time COVID hit, which was just an awful time to get anything rolling. And so it really took a back seat at that point. And this was a, a chance to kind of bring them forward and bring them up to the table. So we have those book discussions. And by the way, I do have actually 20 copies of the book at our library. And you are more than welcome to borrow those book club sets and use those with, you know, your community, your city council, your chamber, whoever else might want to read those with you if, if revitalization is something you're interested in. But once we did that, we then contacted um, several individuals who have done revitalization in their areas in Southwest Iowa because it's nice to have, you know, something fairly close to home in a community that's close to our size that you can say, oh, look, you know, if they can do it, so can we. And so we had, you know, we picked a Thursday evening to do these programs because that was the day we we're open late. And we um, had the speaker come down. We had great attendance for the speakers programs. And then we also had them available. We put it on Facebook Live so that people could see it, you know, if, if they couldn't make it in person. And then 
we told everybody, you know, sh- this person is going to present this week. Next Thursday, we're going to reconvene. And I want you to think about, you know, what did they talk about and how would this relate to Shannon Doe? And kind of let it percolate in your mind. And then when you come back together the next week, let's talk about what can we take from their conversation and their discussion and how can we use that in our community? You know, how can we put some of this stuff into practice here? What's that practical application for us? And so we did. Um, we did this twice. We did it once in August and once in September and, you know, had the community come back together. We got some really good input. And what I loved most about this was that it didn't just stop with the library programs. When those were over, it, it I think, was a, it got the forum going so that they continued on. And now they're having um, quarterly, what they call meeting of the minds. And it's a group of community stakeholders and business people who get together to have discussions. And it's really, it's opened up um, a conversation because I think one of the things that we realized through this is that we don't know what everybody else is doing. And if you don't know what's going on in the community, it's very hard to work together. And so I really think it's opened that line of communication in a bunch of different groups. And, and it has brought us to the table because we're invited to so many more of these things because the community sees the library as a vital part of the revitalization within the community. And that's just a really neat feeling that we can take it on beyond where it went with this grant. And to be perfectly honest with you, I know that the grant cycle is over for right now, but we really didn't need that $3,000 to do this in our community. It wasn't that expensive. We were able to provide an honorarium for our speakers that we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise, but both speakers were willing to come down and do it for free. I mean, that was just kind of icing on the cake. The one thing that I got to do that I've never done before that I've always wondered was I was able to provide babysitting because I get so many people that tell me I can't come to a program because I have to find somebody to watch my kids. Well, let me tell you, they may tell you that, but even if you provide free babysitting, they still don't show up. So there you go. So, you know, until, but until you try it, you just don't know. And I can't, and I won't say that we have the largest groups, but sometimes the smaller groups that you have, you have the absolute best discussion with those individuals. And there's just so much that gets done. And it was just a really great opportunity for us. Thanks, Carrie. I, uh, I like how at the outset of sharing your experience with us, you were just like, to be honest, you had to stretch yourself and kind of get comfortable with facilitating. And um, to that end, actually, there is a question in the chat that I believe is better answered by Becky or Sam, uh, wondering if the e-course that that Carrie was talking about for facilitation, that a- ALA course, is it available in Iowa Learns? And um, go, Becky, what you got? Oh, we're not hearing you. Go ahead, Sam. Oh, for heaven's sake. Sorry. Oh, there you go. Go, go, Sam. If I wasn't sure if you were around or not. Uh, I am, I am here, but to be honest, I don't know enough about the e-course. I do know a lot about Iowa Learns and it is not there, uh, but I don't know enough to tell you where to find it. Right. So, so Becky did share the link to the e-course, which is available through ALA and they host it through their own LMS. So I was going to be surprised if there was some way for you to incorporate it into Iowa Learns, but I mean, who knows, maybe it was the same platform and it was easy to do, but it sounds like it's not, but I do want to give you a heads up. When you go to ALA, you click the link that Becky shared and, um, you have to, in order to sort of get into ALA's LMS system, it's going to ask you to register, but just do it. Don't worry. You're not, you know, signing up for anything. They're not going to spam you and they're not going to ask you for money. It is a free course, regardless of whether you're a small and rural library or not. It's a free free course for everybody, but just know that there's a little bit of a registration process involved really just so that they can get you into their learning management system. That's all. So a heads up that there's a a a little bit of hoop jumping that you have to go through for that. So at this point, we've heard a little bit about the projects for for everybody. I invite you to put your questions into uh, the chat. Uh, I don't think you can unmute and talk. I don't know that you have that opportunity. So let's go to the chat. But in the meantime, I just want to point out that um, I, I wrote down a direct 
chat from Carrie um, or a direct quote, if you don't know what's going on in your community, it's hard to work together. And I feel like that is like the basis of this whole effort. Um, libraries transforming communities by libraries getting to know what's going on in their community, what's important to people. And then and then Zach and Carrie both brought people together around an issue that was important within their community. And I think that um, I mean, that's the nut of the whole effort to do this community engagement stuff, whether it's DEI or community revitalization, or um, my experience was a, a flagging downtown small um, business center wasn't doing any well in Columbus, Wisconsin, where I used to be. So you get to analyze an issue and then talk about it together by bringing people together. Um, I'm going to kind of go to the chat and offer out some questions. Bonnie asks, did any panelists or other libraries transform participants that, I, that we know of include the library itself as one of the presentations? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, goes on to say, with the mission of libraries supporting equity, diversity, and defending intellectual freedom, I wonder if any library people did presentations about library mission and service philosophy. Um, do you have something to say about that, Zach? I Go do. Crazy. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So I will say on my end, we, we were not presenters, but being the facilitator, um, how we, um, what I, what I ended up doing, which is part of, you know, what we needed to do is I, when I met with every single potential speaker, I would begin by discussing, libraries and why libraries are important and then um, connect it to them as to why we encourage them to present. So um, providing our mission and understanding of our profession was part of our conversation to begin the process of collaboration and to begin the process of partnership. So that's how I took that piece, but we weren't actual presenters at the symposium. That's cool. Thanks for sharing that. I will just say, um, Bonnie, your your question is interesting because I think it's the take that it's it's our natural go to as library folks. Like, ooh, we've got people in a room. We want to tell them what libraries do. Um, it's a captive audience. Let's let's capture that. And what I want to say is, when you are truly engaging your community, you're asking questions and you're listening. That's it. And um, you don't say. Oh, I know the answer to that. That's in a database that we have that's for free. Blah, blah. And like you desperately want to, but you don't because your role there is really mostly just to pose those interesting questions, um, sometimes supported with authors or, or visiting scholars or whatever, and let people make their, their own um, kind of conclusions from, from that conversation. So that's the thing about community engagement is we are not putting out our one-way information about the library has this stuff. We are engaging in two-way conversation. And it's almost, I feel like it's most successful when more information is coming into me as the facilitator or the convener or whatever my role is, because that's the point is to just, like Zach said, give people the opportunity to be involved. Um, so not to discount your idea, whenever I did convenings around uh, community engagement, I most certainly had a lot of library swag at the door that people could grab on their way out. So I still wanted to take advantage of a captive audience by getting them the latest newsletter or a grab and go craft or, or whatever to do a, a little bit of, of sharing of our services. Um, but really the point here is just to kind of hear what, what people have on their minds. Okay, let me go here. Uh, Jessica asks, are there any additional funds to reapply for? Uh, they're extending their project and need more funding. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so this iteration of the Small and Rural um, Libraries Transforming Communities grant program is coming to an end. There will not be a fourth round. That's over. So um, I'm sorry to say you'll need to find funds elsewhere, Jessica. Um, but I don't think that it's probably the end of the libraries transforming communities effort. It seems like ALA is scrappy and they keep coming up with, I mean, each of their like big efforts over these past 10 years have been funded by different funders and they keep sort of 
putting it out there and getting something back. So all we can really do is keep our eyes to what's coming up with them. And I have no doubt that Becky and Sam will share those opportunities with you. Um, so, so keep an eye out for that. But in the meantime, do take, take a look at the many, many free resources that they have available on their website at ALA slash LTC. Let me see. Um, Dawn shares, we did ours as health and wellness library support. So Dawn's library, I'm guessing, got one of these grants as well. They had community gatherings that they facilitated maybe to find out what kinds of programs or presenters the community wanted us to provide. That's cool. So that's like doing like community research to see what they need. Uh, they had some extra funds and plan on hosting an international food celebration of some kind. That's awesome. Very cool. It's, so it sounds like a number of you here have been involved with this and are, are potentially grantees. The cool thing about the third round of funding is that it allowed people who had been funded in their first or second round to reapply for grants for things exactly like Dawn brought up. But yeah, unfortunately, that's done. I do want to be sure to ask both Carrie and Zach, now that you've, I mean, you were second round grantees, you're you're done with your projects. What kind of lasting effects has that had with your library and with your community? Are you still seeing ripple effects from that? And what does that look like? Um, go ahead, Carrie. You were the first to nod, so you win. <laughs> oh, well, I get the prize, I guess. Um, well, I was going to say that, you know, with your talk this morning, Cindy, where you talked about the Harwood Institute and those ask questions and things like that, all I could think of was, oh my gosh, I have to remember that so that I can show that to the people on the forum, because when they have another meeting, you know, these are things that they may want to ask. And so it just, it just continues on. I don't think this is ever going to stop. And for those who've read um, Doug Griffith's book, it isn't a sprint to revitalization. It is the baton race that we're, you know, doing our leg and then we're passing it on to the next person. And so it doesn't, you know, this is something that hopefully will continue on for many years past the point even that I'm the library director, but we will hopefully be involved in it as long as it's, it's going on. And so that's the nice thing is that it, you know, it wasn't that, oh, this grant's over. I filled out my form. I turned everything in. Whew, we're done. That's it. it. It's something that, you know, the community is going to remember for years and years. Zach, did you want to share what your, yeah. Uh, um, I, I totally agree. The funding is, you know, no longer, but we are keeping activating community voices as a library project forever. Um, so we are going to continue to have it as a, kind of a community building opportunity where we're going to expand on our partnerships and these conversations. And, and that brings me to the question about funding. So when we we're going to have our upcoming stakeholders or dialogue group, um, and that's what we're going to ask if if this is something sustainable, if there is, let's say, money that needs to be um, you know, if we need to get money, let's work collectively as a group. You know, are there grants available? Um, do you have a foundation? Is there a friends group? So if there, if money is needed, um, it's it, that's part of that collaboration too. Um, and especially with grants, if you can really demonstrate that this is going to be a collaborative project or program or event, um, sometimes it's it's a lot easier to um, to get money. So so I guess in essence we are going to keep the project going, um, and we'll just see what comes out of it. So. Well, I I'm glad you mentioned that the money aspect of it. I feel like it's like that that's sort of a surprise gem that comes out of applying for one of these grants um even though there was paperwork you had to do to put in your application and it was a you know a little bit of a rigmarole um, on your end to apply for the funds ala was really straightforward and they they provided assistance with it in the first round they had people regionally who would literally help you craft craft and ask that they knew would be funded and i think that that's in the, in the same way that Carrie talked about needing to build her confidence as a facilitator, I feel like many of us could use a, a little shot in the arm in building our, our confidence as 
grant writers and fund seekers. And Zach's right, it doesn't have to be a grant. It, it can be that your mission and a partner organization's mission line up just so fantastically that they see expending money out of their budget as completely in keeping with what they were going to do anyway in the case of your symposium, right? They, they gave you of their own free will. Uh, yeah, so that's the other thing, though, is when I look and following up with what Carrie said, you know, looking at the budget and what we allocated it for, it was for speaker uh, books and I think um, some of the lunches or something like that. So when I look back at the budget and then I think about future projects, if I didn't have that money, we would still have a successful event. And I agree with you. It was just an added gem. It was just like, Hey, look, we have money, but uh, that's what I, when I went back to our stakeholders in our dialogue group, I said, if we don't have $3,000 to go off of. That cannot be what stops us from this community partnership, this connection as well. So just know that money is always great, but if you don't have it or can't get access to a lot of it, you can still be successful at, at what you're doing. Well, and librarians, like you said, they're, they're scrappy right we figure out how to do it with virtually nothing in a in a budget line but it's nice to be able to do it a little bit bigger than maybe you would have been able to without those funds but then the thing that does by um writing a successful grant it builds your confidence and maybe going after something else so i'll just say though this current um grant has run its course do keep your eyes on lt on ala they are very often putting out opportunities to get small grants, what they consider small grants, they think $3,000 is small, and to some libraries it is, to some libraries it is truly transformative. Uh, but but keep your eye, and you, you don't have to be an ALA member necessarily to apply. In some cases you do, in some cases you don't, um, but just keep your eyes open. Any questions? Um, that, that folks would like to ask now is an opportunity. We've got just a couple of minutes left in our time. And I want to apologize to Dawn and um, the person at Knoxville Public Library. I conflated your two chats into one thing that I read. Sorry about that. I think that that might be us wrapping up. Sam and Becky, do you have anything to ask or to add? I don't particularly. It's really fun to to hear the stories of of people that used the money. Um, I got to be part of the team that actually handed some of that grant money out, and some of the projects were just astounding. I was so excited, and I would love to see some more follow ups of you know not just what Iowa Libraries did, but some of the projects from across the country were really exciting. Actually, along those lines, so that is the next thing that I know is for sure coming as part of this effort is ALA will be publishing case studies of some of those libraries that, that did small transformative programs or, or bigger splashy transformative programs, just so you can see yourself in the effort, because it always takes that first step to get you started in something. So you can look for those case studies coming. I don't know the time frame, but that'll be the next thing that comes from them. So you'll get to follow some of those grants and see what happened with them, right? Great, that's cool. And Sam, I'm trying to think, did we have anything planned for some of the other Iowa libraries to share um, their we success do. stories? Good. Oh, success stories? No, oh, yeah. I don't have planned, but I do want to take a minute to plug the next trustee training we have coming up. Um, but before I do that, to say thank you to Zach, Carrie, Kristen, and Cindy for time with us tonight. And um, I do think that uh, there's a lot we can learn uh, for sure. And I do hope we can continue to highlight some of this stuff. So Becky, Cindy, Kristen, I, you know, I think we should, uh, we should continue to promote some of this. Um, so let me... Um, just say that if you are here tonight, you probably are already a member of a, a mostly effective library board because you're here prioritizing your own continuing education. Um, however, our next trustee training opportunity is called the 10 Habits of Highly Effective Library Boards. Um, if you were with us in November, we uh, had a speaker from uh, Callahan Municipal Consultants come in and talk about working with city councils. 
and uh, he's going to do a presentation for us again on um, on effect the effective the habits of effective boards. And so I put the link to that in the in the chat there. Make sure someone from your board gets registered, or all of your board gets registered, and you can watch it all together. Uh, the evaluation link is coming as well. Um, I did also want to mention for folks. Um, I said you could get all of your hours in done by March if you wanted to, and that is true. Um, we don't have the registration open yet, but in March we will be doing a session specifically for boards on intellectual freedom and uh, the role that uh, public library boards and school library boards can play uh, in supporting intellectual freedom and uh, rights to access information in their communities. So keep your eye out for that as well, but um, the 10 Habits session will be in February. So uh, with that being said, the last thing I owe you is the link to the evaluation, and that is now in the chat as well. So um, we had about 150 to 200 people with us throughout the day today. Um, just such an exciting day. And um, you can uh, complete that evaluation. Let us know what you thought. We'll make sure that all the hours get added to your um, Iowa Learns account. So um, with that being said, uh, I think I have nothing else. Um, I, I don't either, except to echo something that somebody said a little bit earlier up, a great ending to a great day. I, I just think we had such wonderful sessions today, and this was sort of the topper for it. Yes, absolutely. Well, thanks for including us, and Zach and Carrie and Kristen, thanks for joining us on a cold, cold evening and sharing your experiences. Thank you.